Good morning, everyone. We're going to give it a few seconds while we wait for everyone to join the room. But welcome to our Council on Sage virtual webinar, which we've been doing monthly now. I think this is our fourth of the year. Dave would check me on that number. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, it looks like we've got a good chunk of um, participants joined and we should have a few more joining soon, but we'll get started. Um, welcome everyone. Welcome to our next Council on Sage virtual program, Challenges, Solutions and Success Stories in Affordable Senior Housing. I'm Marissa Feliciano of HPI Architecture and I'm currently serving as Vice President for the Sage Council. Um, on behalf of the um, Board of Directors, I just want to say thank you to all our sponsors. And I'm going to share my screen so we can um, just say thank you to all of our sponsors. Um, this is how we keep everything going, how we keep the lights on and putting programs together for all of you. Um, High Ridge Costa, All Valley Washer, Rancho Mission Viejo, our platinum sponsors, HPI Architecture, our gold sponsor, and KTGY, our silver sponsor. Um, and then all of our wonderful bronze sponsors that um, help us keep this going. So thank you, everyone. Uh, I also want to say thank you to CW Driver. They're our today's event sponsor. Um, CW Driver is a premier builder serving Southern California since 1919. In 2019, the historic company proudly celebrated its 100 year anniversary. As a leader in general contracting and construction management services, CW Driver is on the cutting edge across a broad spectrum of industries, including senior independent living, assisted living, and memory care. Uh, now, just to, to kick things off, I'm going to turn things over to our moderator. Today, we have Sean Leonard, um, who's going to share a little bit more, set the stage for us. Um, Sean Leonard has more than 30 years of experience in Southern California real estate develop, development and construction industry. He began his career as a concrete subcontractor and progressed to general contracting and development management. His most notable project is Walt Disney Concert Hall. Some of you may have heard about that. Uh, one of two projects Mr. Leonard managed that was awarded the prestigious AIA Presidential Honoree for Building Team of the Year. After the successful completion of the Disney Hall in 2003, Sean formed SL Leonard & Associates, a certified MBE firm specializing in project and construction management that represents institutions, developers, nonprofits, and public agencies with their real estate needs. SL Leonard & Associates has assisted its clients in managing the construction or renovation of over 5,500 units of affordable housing, much of it being senior housing. He holds a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from UCLA and an MBA from USC. He also serves on boards of a community of friends, the Ventura County Community Foundation and Casa Pacifica Centers for Children and Families. So I wanna say welcome, Sean. Thank you, Marissa, I appreciate that. Um, this is gonna be an exciting event uh, and I'm happy to moderate it. Thank you for the invitation. Today, we're gonna to talk about the Silva tsunami, right? The senior population that is growing like crazy. I mean, right now we're at approximately 50 million seniors at 65 and above. And by 2050, that's forecasted to increase by 70% and then double by 2060. So there's a lot of people out there like me that you have to take care of. <laughs> um, and we're going to talk today about senior housing and a focus on affordable housing. <clears throat> and, you know, my firm, uh, we have a lot of clients that uh, develop affordable housing. And I've seen the, 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 the differences, you know, and the challenges they have, you know, in affordable housing, um, one of the biggest ways they can finance them is through the low income housing tax credits where they can leverage private equity. Uh, with these tax credits and then there's taxes and bonds, but you know, there's all sorts of funding from different agencies for different population bases. Um, and then there's different requirements. You know, there's, there's uh, one source of money where the, um, uh, if, if your project is over, I think it's 55 units, you need to have a project labor agreement. And then, you know, the state prevailing wages, you know, if the, <clears throat> if the building is over four stories, you have to have commercial you know, prevailing wages rather than residential. So there's so many different rules 
that these developers uh, have to navigate. I, I marvel at it, you know, and you know, each project is not just you know one loan and and they're off and running, right? They have to secure all this funding, and the timing is all different for each one. Uh, sometimes they'll they'll have a tax credit reservation, but they don't know if they've got it yet. Um, so it's it's uh, daunting work um, in the nonprofit industry, um, but. You know, as, as you'll see today that uh, these panelists are very passionate about what they do and uh, because it's very rewarding work too. And, you know, today we have uh, three very smart, experienced, influential executives and, you know, they lead organizations that are on, on the cutting edge um, of, of affordable housing. Uh, and uh, we're going to start, I think, by, <clears throat> so we're going to have, uh, each speaker is going to do a presentation, then we'll have some Q&A. So let me introduce our first speaker, uh, Laura Archuleta. Uh, since 1999, Laura Archuleta has guided Jamboree Housing Corporation from a small Irvine, California-based nonprofit affordable housing developer with 750 units into one of the nation's largest nonprofit owners, having developed over 9,500 homes in more than 96 communities. Under Ms. Archuleta's leadership, Jamboree established Housing with Heart to deliver impactful resident services, acquired Homes Inc., a leading nonprofit provider of housing and support for people living with mental illness, and launched, launched Jamboree's construction group, Quality Development and Construction Inc. Laura currently is on the Affordable Housing Advisory Council of the Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco, is a member of the boards of the California Housing Consortium, and the Building Industry Association of California and a member of the United, States, United Way Orange County Leadership Council. She earned a bachelor's degree in criminal justice and a master's degree in public administration from Cal State University Fullerton. Uh, so Laura, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Sean. And thank you for having me today. It's always a pleasure to speak to this group. Um, for my entire career, 30 plus years in housing, um, I've always just enjoyed um, working on senior developments, whether it was when I was on the city side or now coming to Jamboree. And so this group um, holds a special place in my heart. I know that it is a, a group that works on much broader senior issues, but in the affordable space, there is such a need and that we continue to see. And I'm I'm just excited to be here to talk to you today about a, a couple of our developments that we've built and kind of give you an update on Jamboree. So um, next slide, uh, kind of just giving you an overview about Jamboree. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. So um, our mission is to deliver high quality affordable housing and services that transform lives and strengthen communities. And you can see we do have, um, you know, a really, uh, broad vision, right? Creating um, strong, healthy, sustainable communities with the hope that every, every person can live in one. And we don't do that alone. So we do that through partnerships. And um, the two women who are on the panel with me, um, we have partnered with to work on this mission and this uh, vision. So it's pretty exciting work. It, I'm in my 22nd year at Jamboree, and it is just it's a lot of work, it's overwhelming sometimes, but it's very exciting to be um, helping so many people um, live a, a higher quality of life uh, in their housing. So um, we are a statewide um, nonprofit. Uh, it says on the slide that we're the largest, I'd say we're one of the largest. I don't know that we're, different, that we're actually the largest, but we're pretty active here in California. So from the numbers, um, this kind of just gives you an overview of where we're at, right? One mission, uh, 93 plus properties, 9,000 units, um, over 18,000 residents. And when I talk about partners, again, over 200 partners, and we partner with other developers, we'll partner with service providers. We do partner with for-profits if they have a, a need you know, for a nonprofit partner. Um, Jamboree's up, to over 100 employees and over half of our employees actually work on the resident services side. So a very robust resident services um, group. And um, the other thing I'd add to that is 
in the last 10 years, we've been really active in permanent supportive housing. So right now you're seeing this push to end homelessness or work towards at least trying to get a handle on homelessness. And um, the senior population in within that subgroup um, is growing. And that is where we see our future projects going is in this group of seniors who are experiencing homelessness. So um, with that, I do have three projects I was going to present. Um, I am going to present today. And um, I tried to pick a variety of developments. So Heritage Villas is a project in Mission Viejo. It's 143 units. And it was developed back in 2000. So early on, I had just come into Jamboree and it was in a partnership with a for-profit who ended up going out of business. And so Jambri took over the property. It originally was a bond and tax credit project. So kind of traditional affordable housing finance, but over the years, right, it had its wear and tear and our seniors aged there. So in 2017, we did a recapitalization of this project and we were able to put in over $6 million of renovations. And a lot of that money, I was really surprised, but a lot of that money went into ensuring that our aging seniors could get around on the property. This is built into a hillside right off of um, the five freeway there in Mission Viejo. And so our seniors were having trouble even getting around the property. So the path of travel, um, we had to create some new paths, move some things around to make it work, and then just overall just upgrade the uh, units inside and outside. So the rents here um, are about $700 a month, uh, up to about $1,000 a month. So it is pretty um, pretty low income, and it's been a popular property the whole time that we've owned it. Um, it's one of the few affordable well, overall affordable projects in South County, but definitely one of the few affordable um, projects. This is a development here as our seniors have aged, and we'll talk a little bit later about some of these challenges, but our seniors have uh, brought in caregivers oftentimes, their families may be helping them with some caregivers on site, because where can you go where they have assistance and pay um, you know, $1,000 a month, $800 a month. So we do see that happening at this property. The next property I'm going to talk about is really unique. Um, it's the Meadows and Irvine. And this is actually Jamboree's largest asset. It was, it's not developed with tax credits or specific um, affordable financing programs. It what, although I would say for nonprofits, and this is unique to nonprofits, is we do have the availability of 501c3 bonds. So this was a 501c3 bond project. It's 360 spaces, 50 acres um, in Irvine. It is a, a very, very aging community. We have 10 to 12% of the residents there who are shut ins. We have full time resident services on staff there. Um, the community building there, we did renovate back in 2014. Snyder Langston did a great job of renovation for us on that project. That was prior to us having our own construction company in-house, so we partnered with them. And um, just a cute story on this one, um, which I love. Uh, so that, because this is a mobile home park, it's a little bit different, right? Each resident owns their coach and they rent our space uh, the space from us. And those spaces run from about 650 to about $1,000 a month, depending on their income range. And um, so the seniors really know each other in this park. They have a very active homeowners association and group there. And when we did the renovation and we did, we're doing the grand opening, there was a line out the door and around the building waiting to come in to see it. We made a really big deal about it. And we heard time and time again how their spouse, um, typically their husbands, got dressed up for the first time in months to come out and see the new community building. So I thought it was just really telling of how the space, right, and the feeling in that space, how proud it made them and it made them want to individually kind of dress up and go out and get engaged with the residents. So it's a really um, 
unique property that we own that we're really proud of. And the next project that I'm going to talk about today is um, called Wesley Village. And Wesley Village is unique. It's a, a multi-generational project. So um, there's a standalone building for families and a standalone building for seniors, and then shared space in between. Um, this was built on uh, surplus land owned by the Methodist Church in Garden Grove. And so we were able to put together some financing with help from the city to actually pay a upfront lease payment to the church to help them get financially stable and then um, build this development. On a side note, the um, several of our families and seniors are now uh, part of the congregation there at the church. So it's helping to build the congregation. It, we do have rents there ranging from $800 to $1,300 a month. And we have five service partners on site. Um, we have a Head Start program as well as a younger child care program, and we have a health clinic there. Um, from a design feature, what I like um, about this project is um, there's uh, um, on Acacia Boulevard there in Garden Grove, there was an overlay where they wanted um, commercial to go in. And um, I'm sure uh, developers, you have dealt with cities who want commercial on the first floor in an area that's really not going to support commercial uh, revenue. And so we were able to bring in these five service partners to, so it has a commercial feel, but they are resident service partners that serve the residents of the property as well as the uh, broader community. So this was a, um, a, a, a project of love. We were really excited about it. Our seniors do interact in the services with our families. So one of the programs that um, we often look for is almost this grandparenting match. If you have seniors who are willing to volunteer with the kids in those the different programs, we really like to um, bring that together. So um, there is a, a separate community room also for the seniors when they wanna get away from the families and the kids. So um, those are the three projects that I um, wanted to, to present to you today. And um, I look forward to uh, answering any questions you might have. So thank you again for having me. Thanks, Laura. Those are really great projects. Um, our next speaker is Leanne Ticano. As Director of Southern California Operations for Related California, Ms. Ticano leads Related's affordable residential development throughout Southern California. She's currently overseeing a pipeline of 1,000 affordable family, senior, and permanent supportive housing units and her responsibilities encompass all aspects of the development process, including acquisition, entitlements, finance, design, construction, leasing, and marketing. She directs project development teams and is responsible for the daily operating efficiency of these pipeline developments. Since joining Related in 2005, she's successfully managed the completion of 22 family and senior tax credit finance developments and been directly responsible for the development of more than 2,100 affordable family, senior and permanent supportive housing units, including the Gold Nugget Award, awarded development located in Irvine, Solera at Pavilion Park, Luminera, Aspera, Luminera Aspera and Luxera at Parasol Park. I should have practiced those words beforehand. Leanne holds a bachelor's degree in business administration with an emphasis in real estate finance and a minor in web technologies and applications from the University of Southern California, fight on. In 2006, she served as the Nisei Week Queen in Los Angeles' Little Tokyo, representing the Japanese American community at numerous international and national events. Leanne. Thank you, Sean. And really just a pleasure to be here. Um, all right, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. All right, so um, Related California, We've been around for over 30 years and developed more than 15,000 market rate mixed, in, mixed income and affordable housing units in California. Since uh, 1995, Related has developed over 2,900 senior residences throughout California. Um, our current pipeline includes an additional 600 um, throughout California and Portland. Next slide. 
So in terms of how Related got into affordable senior housing, um, Related always sought to, to build a wide band of affordable housing, whether senior, large family. Um, and although Related's first affordable senior housing projects were located in La Mirada, um, we really do feel the genesis of our affordable senior housing was our public and private partnership with the city of Fontana. Um, on a personal note, when I got hired, uh, the first projects I worked on were the Fontana deals, um, phases, I, I believe it was phase two. Um, in 2003, Related completed the first of uh, four affordable senior communities in Fontana. Um, and the city had this really grand plan for the area. So in 2010, the city built a 4,300 square foot senior center um, in the surrounding neighborhood to service the local senior residents. Um, and by the time the senior center opened, all four phases had been completed um, and completed and uh, a total of 365 affordable senior units. Next slide. So we often get this question um, because related California, we really do um, the, the far spectrum of residential or I'd just say real estate. Um, we build luxury market rate housing, and we also build 100% affordable housing developments. And we really don't build anything in between. In either case, we design all of our communities, um, including our senior communities, uh, to be indistinguishable um, from market rate housing. So this slide kind of gives you an idea um, where our market rate team right now is working on San Francisco's first luxury market rental senior housing development um, with uh, Atria Senior Living. Um, Atria is a industry leading senior housing management services operator in North America. So they operate not only in the US, but also in Canada. Um, let's see, this development will offer best in class finishes and customized assisted living services. So the services are really key on the, on the market rate side. Um, in terms of just, you know, a little bit about the differences between the two, you know, we're looking at still services on both sides, whether it's senior um, affordable versus market rate senior. Uh, but, you know, there is a little bit of a difference in terms of the customization um, that goes with it. Units are also a little bit smaller as well on the affordable side. They're really from, um, from the architectural and the amenities el uh, elements, they're really pretty much similar. All right, next slide. Uh, this is just a slide to kind of give you an idea. These are um, a many shots from some of our affordable senior housing projects. Next slide. Okay, so I wanted to get into a couple of our projects in our portfolio um, that help that really addressed building affordable senior housing. Um, the first one here is Bloomington Grove and Lillian Court. So um, one of the issues developing senior affordable housing is finding the appropriate funds. Um, so similar to um, Laura um, with her Wesley Village project in Garden Grove, uh, the solution that related implemented here was building an intergenerational um, development in which the same development has a component of both large family and senior. Um, of course, you know, in order to qualify for tax credits, the senior units and family units needed to be in separate buildings. Um, so what's really also really special about this project in particular that I love um, is that it was county sponsored and they also wanted us to develop their, um, uh, their the Bloomington Public Library. Um, so not only do you have large family seniors, um, they have their own separate community spaces, but there's also a public library from the first floor of the senior building. Um, and in this project, we built 70 affordable, affordable senior units and 120 affordable family units. Next slide. All right, more recently, inclusionary housing has been the way related has been able to develop senior affordable housing. Um, for example, located in the master plan community of the Great Park neighborhoods in Irvine, Luxera is the second affordable senior community developed um, in collaboration with Five Point. Um, and 
and really the final component, unifying three generations living in close proximity. Um, you know, one thing we were noting when we started working on these projects, the Great Recession of 2008 left many retirees facing the daunting task of, of finding affordable senior living options that are close to their families. So, you know, even today, as housing prices skyrocket, um, we do feel that Lexera fills that affordable housing gap um, in the area without compromising design and style. Um, in fact, Lexera received the 2018 Stage Award for Best 55 Plus Affordable Rental Community in the New Construction category. All right, next slide. Um, so these are just a couple of photos of some of our interiors and exteriors of um, some of our more recent affordable senior housing developments. Next slide. Oh, perfect. All right. Well, this concludes my presentation. Um, you know, thank you again. Pleasure to be here. Looking forward to answering any questions you may have. Um, Sean, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you. Thanks, Leanne. That was great. And you know, as we can see, the quality of the developments uh, are first class. They use the best architects, the best builders, and they're building a quality product. And in most cases, it's an improvement of what we was there before they built their building. And that's been, been my experience. So um, when these affordable developments come into a neighborhood, I, I think it's actually becomes an asset, not only because of the population base, but the quality of the housing. Um, thanks, Leanne. <clears throat> um, our next speaker is Rochelle Mills. Um, as president and CEO, Rochelle Mills is responsible for guiding innovative housing opportunities vision and implementing its mission to create thriving, economically vibrant communities anchored by high quality housing. During her ten tenure with IHO, she has helped the portfolio grow 350%. Rochelle is hands-on hands across the organization and oversees housing development, new program initiatives, business development and stakeholder relations and legislative advocacy and policy interests. Michelle brings a diverse background to architecture, design, construction, administration, community planning, writing, and cultural tourism. She is the immediate past president of the Southern California Association of Nonprofit Housing and serves on several public and nonprofit boards, services committees, and leader groups, including the Kennedy Commission, California Association of Local Housing Finance Agencies, Lanterman Housing Alliance and Arts of Los Angeles. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Rochelle Mill, who in full disclosure is one of our clients. So I have to be on my best behavior today. Thanks, Sean. Um, if you can start. I love to start with this image because it's a perfect example of the kind of emotion we want to evoke in the communities we uh, create. It is a um, mixed income, uh, multi-ethnic, uh, diverse community for age, abilities, income levels, just the kind of walkable community that helps create that kind of catalytic movement um, to, keep, um, to keep the growth going long after IHO's footprint or thumbprint happens in a neighborhood. Uh, next. The thing that's really important to us as a team, we came together, our board, our staff, uh, our advisors, and we wanted to know what is the difference? There are so many great developers that are out there, but what is the difference that IHO brings? And we believe it's our commitment to excellence that sets us apart. Comprehensive catalytic development, as I mentioned, mixed income and mixed populations, a commitment to architecture and art, integrated tailored case management and services, community impact and engagement, which we believe very strongly in, and authenticity, particularly in light of all that's been going on in the last year. Uh, we wanna make sure we are going beyond the marketing statements that all of our colleagues are submitting and making sure that it goes across our organization, our board and our business practices. Next slide, please. This is the very first uh, development that IHO uh, created. IHO was formed in 1976 out of the result of a lawsuit that forced the city of Irvine to create 
uh, provision for low to moderate income housing in their planning documents. It's interesting that that lawsuit also is the, uh, had an impetus in uh, housing elements across the state. And so we take great pride that uh, all of cities and jurisdictions across the state now are going through and making sure that there are provisions for low to moderate income housing. As a result, the very first project that I hope built was in 1981 in uh, the city of Irvine. We were Irvine Housing Opportunities at the time, and it was for uh, seniors and disabled in the city. Uh, the first uh, phase was built with 100 units. It's right along the creek bed on Lake in between Culver and Barranca Boulevards. And that was the sole project that I hope owned for almost, uh, almost 40 years. Uh, go to the next slide, please. These are the images of the project right now. The image to the left is uh, Woodridge Manor number two. In 1981, we built 100 units, but the demand was so great, even in that young city that was only five years old, that we had to, uh, or 10 years old at that time, we had to add another 50 units. And the top building on the right was the last iteration of this project in 2006, when we added 15 tax credit units the bottom right is the original uh, 1981 building. Uh, fun story is when we celebrated its 30th anniversary, we hosted an event and we invited all the neighbors and we got a guy uh, who, came, who came and he spoke to me and he said, you know, I hear that they're going to try to put affordable housing in this neighborhood. Can you believe that? And I said, well, isn't that interesting? You're already standing in affordable housing that's been here for 30 years. What's significant about that is what Laura said and Leanne as well. Our work is indistinguishable from market rate projects. And for those naysayers who are concerned about us bringing down the, the value, there is documentation that shows not only does it not bring down the value, but in lower income communities, it actually is the catalyst that raises the value and sets in motion the investment, the reinvestment in those uh, underinvested communities. So something to be really proud of. Next slide, please. This is the most recent project that we completed. It's Elvarano Apartments in Anaheim. That first building that we did, as I mentioned, was for seniors and disabled. As time has gone on, uh, it is now synonymous. Fully integrated services are part of the DNA of affordable housing and senior housing in particular. What, is, uh, what has layered on is that now we are looking at different capacities and abilities uh, acuity levels. And so El Verano Apartments in Anaheim is 50% seniors, 50% formerly homeless seniors or formerly unhoused seniors. Next slide, please. And this is an image of what it looks like today. The reason why I'm showing you this image is because I, if you take a look at the circles on the uh, ground in, in the uh, fence, we convene um, a public art commission at each of our projects. And uh, for some reason, our, our, uh, our colleagues, we have uh, electeds, we have city agency staff, we have low-income residents, community members. We're doing this in conjunction with Museo. We just love to make sure that the building that we are creating becomes a resource for the community. And so it, what you can see at the top right is a, uh, the last component of the three public art pieces that we will put in, which is a living wall that, will, uh, that we are doing in conjunction with Museo and our residents. And it will give uh, an opportunity for the residents to, to be engaged in helping to plant that, for people to drive by and really, when they stop and see this public art, for them to really engage and understand the impact that we are having is beyond the notion of us warehousing or dropping the least of these in their communities. But these buildings that we are creating are in a lot of ways uplifting the entire community. Directly behind it where you see the palm trees is a project that Jamboree and Iva worked on together. 
that was one of our first projects where we installed uh, public art in the form of lampstands. But what I love about this is that is a family project. This is a senior project. We've got a resident whose grandmother now lives in the senior housing and we've got cross programming as uh, uh, Leanne and Laura have talked about. That is so vitally important in terms of mixing, uh, mixing the generations and just bringing some value to the lives of the residents we serve. Next slide, please. If you wouldn't mind clicking on this, this is a very quick video, but it talks about, it shows you the impact that we have in the work we do. I think you have to turn on your sound, uh, your video sound. But if, if, that, if you can't do that, then, then we can go on. And one of the things that we love about this is the stories that they talk about of the impact of the work are very simple things that we take for granted. One member talks about the fact that he doesn't have to worry about food. He doesn't have to worry about furnishings. Another woman says that the beauty is in seeing the light come through in the morning, things that we take for granted. What people are asking for in affordable housing that they don't ask for in market rate housing is we are expected to be all things to all people. We're expected to take care of the social, the health, the food needs, the uh, environmental concerns, the sustainability. No other developer is asked to take care of all of that and provide housing at deeply affordable rates. Uh, go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is something that we'll, um, we may or may not have time to touch on. This is Senate Bill 591. We've talked about inter intergenerational housing, but one of the challenges is that the only way to actually accomplish that at this point is to create two separate buildings side by side. The value is in having people fully integrated. But because of the way the funding is uh, set up, you can't do that uh, because you've got competing uh, uh, funding priorities that really don't uh, work well in the uh, sandbox. But this bill, SB 9, uh, 591, is uh, trying to find a way to take those housing uh, developments that are targeting 55 years and older. And if 80% uh, of those units are set aside for seniors, then they will allow 20% of the units to be set aside to be occupied by transition age youth, which are the fastest growing homeless population in the state and those uh, caregivers to be able to live on site. And that gives them a, uh, an amazing economy of scale and affordability because those who take care of our residents are often living in cars themselves. Next slide. I wanna show you a project that we worked on that I think is the future of, um, uh, of affordable housing for seniors. This is a competition that we entered in a uh, little Tokyo community in downtown Los Angeles. And it, it, we put together 78 units, but it was a much larger community economic development. And the reason why this is important to me is because we are not simply creating shady acres, uh, Dell Web communities where people check in, but they don't check out. We are creating places where people are engaged in their community. This doesn't matter their age. Uh, we want them to be in connected, active, uh, to have programming happen uh, adjacent to where they live so that they are um, eliminating that isolation and, and just really becoming active members of the community. So in this community, we designed it for both senior and Tay population, because we know that the young people can use the wisdom and the structure that seniors may bring. Seniors can use that, that vibrancy that the young people can bring. And we've got on-site property management to help these groups get along. It also included affordable live workspace, uh, work development space in terms of the retail spaces downstairs. We had identified uh, some uh, businesses that were great entree ports, soft skills ports for transition age youth, but also uh, acknowledging the legacy businesses that were in that community. 
cultural spaces because the reality is when we move into communities, there usually is a cultural DNA. And if you make the point to honor it, then you usually have very good relationships and not so much uh, animus and, and uh, fighting against the neighbors. And it was a transit oriented community. Go to the next slide, please. One of the things that I wanted to show here was that it allowed for privacy of the residents because when you're dealing with residents who are coming out of homelessness, you need to allow them the time to get comfortable uh, engaging. So it allowed for a building that was um, uh, where they could engage with their neighborhood from all sides. You had different kinds of plazas that were open to the public. This is something that we are partnering with Parks and Recs on our projects to make sure that those spaces are available to the public during uh, business hours, but then are private to the residents. But on all levels, we allowed for that mixed uh, multi-generation destination, cultural, uh, culturally sensitive uh, development that I do think is the direction that affordable housing is going and certainly senior housing as well. Uh, last slide. Uh, if you would like to partner with us, ask us questions about any of our work, we're more than happy. You can either reach out to uh, Miguel Garcia, who's our director of real estate development. And at the top, that's actually Rochelle Mills. You can reach out to Rochelle, uh, me as well, and we'd be happy to share with you. Thank you, Rochelle. Thank you. That was great. Um, so we're running a little behind, but we have some uh, questions that I've prepared. And um, there's a Q&A icon on the bottom of the screen. And if, if you have questions for the panelists, feel free to use that. We'll try and address as many of them as we can. Um, my first question, and you, Leanne, you touched on this a little bit, but maybe if there's anything else you want to elaborate, how does affordable senior housing development differ from market rate senior housing? Can you share some insights into the culture approach and process? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we do the far spectrums of uh, residential development, luxury market rate, 100% affordable. Um, as it relates to senior housing, we don't do the exact or direct counterpart, which is um, market rate independent affordable senior living. Um, so, you know, we, we talked about the first project that our market rate side is uh, working on in San Francisco, um, really from an approach and process standpoint, it is very similar between the two, you know, really creating that quality of life for our residents um, and ultimately, you know, helping seniors thrive. That's really um, what's, what's most important. Um, I went a little bit into the, the differences um, from a high level you know, of course, the financing is very different. You, you know, we're on the affordable housing side, you're capped at your rents um, and you're building a financing stack with soft lenders. Um, on the market rate side, really investor returns, things of that nature. Um, in terms of the product itself, very indistinguishable between market rate and affordable. Um, maybe the finishes are a little bit more upscale, upscale um, on the market rate side. And then of course the units tend to be a little bit larger on the market rate side than the affordable side, but still even on the affordable side, very livable. Great. Laura, do, would you like to chime in? Yeah, the, the only thing I'd add is on our affordable development is we're always, it's just the difficulties of the financing, right? And so when we've hired project managers in from market rate senior housing, it's just, it seems so much simpler because they're looking just for IRR. It's easier to get the fine. You know, they know if they set the deal up right that they'll be able to get the financing. We're on the affordable side. You're competing every year. The QAP is changing, so you don't know. Um, you know, is there going to be funding for your for your project? So we have to be really flexible, right? A core value at Jambri, really flexible. Uh, to change a project to go from a standalone senior to adding in permanent supportive housing to at, making it intergenerational. And um, so that's what that's the only other thing that I'd add into what, you know, upon build upon what Leanne mentioned. Okay. Thanks. Well, Rochelle, are there some challenges that you see in tax credit and other subsidized financing? Uh. You know, the problem that I have with our public funding, not just the tax credits, is that they are just not nimble. 
the world that we live in is fluid. Uh, housing elements are eight years. Um, funding cycles come around a few times a year, but if you miss one, you may end up putting your project out uh, for another two years. That, um, it keeps us mired in the kind of inefficiency that really works against housing. Uh, and, you know, they say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I know that that is not the intention, but the reality is, uh, I, you know, I'll, I'll give you a quick example. We had a project that the city, uh, we worked with the city and they helped us acquire sites in 2013. By 2021, uh, there had been so many different delays, election cycles, uh, holds on funding, et cetera. Um, e economic wrinkles, challenges, sequel challenges. By the time the project was ready to move forward at the end of 2020, it had gone from a 141 unit project to a 50 unit rehab. We lost 90 units in the inefficiency of going through the traditional mm -hmm. processes. By the grace of God, you don't waste a good crisis. And so, um, you know, COVID allowed reform to happen in Sidlac, and that project may come back to life as 89 units, but we nevertheless lost 30 units. That kind of, of inefficiency, I think, is malpractice. Uh, I don't know how to get by it because every jurisdiction is doing something different. Every funding source has a different body that is, is uh, in charge of it. It, and, and everybody is trying to work, but I find that they are all working in silos. And the result is that the work that we are doing is siloing uh, the residents, all seniors, all very low income, all luxury. It's not getting to what is the highest and best for our, our communities. Um, so Laura, um... Rochelle talked about sequel challenges. Uh, are there other community uh, issues, uh, opposition that you face with your projects? And you know, how do you mitigate that? Sure, and I was just gonna kind of building on Rochelle's comment. Uh, I don't know if any of you have gone and uh, gone into a classroom uh, at an urban planning environment, but whenever I go back and I'm talking to a group of students, they always throw out the ideal, right? And the ideal is to have everyone mixed together, communicating, right? And, and you just sit there and you think, why can't it be like that? And the challenges is that Rochelle was mentioning, it's just sometimes they're just such, they just pile on, right? And you, you just wanna go back to those students and say, you're right, you're right, let's do it that way. But um, yes, so I, I did wanna comment a little bit on community outreach and we all do it and we do it in different ways. And historically we've held, uh, you know, it started with maybe some large meetings where you have big groups come and you do a presentation and question and answers. But it, they, it, that's evolved. We've done charrettes. We've done all types of different, you know, use creative techniques to pull in community input, uh, input into our developments and our design and our programming. But what was unique with the working remotely is that we started doing everything virtual. And I think it's been some really big benefits that we've seen in the communities where we're doing outreach. We have about a billion dollars of pre-development going on, um, uh, worth of deals in pre-development in our pipeline. And so we've been doing community meetings across the state for about 12 developments. And we have structured those um, to be virtual where we folks call in, they can sign up into different breakout rooms with different topics. So those topics could be design. Oftentimes we're doing a lot of um, permanent supportive housing within a development, so maybe 10%. So people want to hear about what, who's gonna be living there, who are these folks coming from uh, homelessness or currently experiencing homeless, maybe dual diagnose. Uh, diagnosis issues. And so how are we going to be supporting them? Security, um, timeline. Um, the success in, in those meetings 
I, I've been really impressed with. I was very, very concerned when COVID hit because we had this pipeline of projects going of how can we continue to do community outreach. The other uh, follow up part to it is we can put everything we create these web pages, website pages, where we can put all the information on and then all the Q and A's. And so you're getting information out to people who oftentimes couldn't make it to community meetings. Think back to those cities. Many cities still have their planning commission meetings during the day, right? They'd have city council meetings during the day or in the evening when parents or working folks can't get there. And so um, I am very, very hopeful that this will kind of stick going forward, that we'll be able to do these virtual meetings and get more people involved in providing us input so that we can be developing the best projects to meet the needs of those communities where we're working. Great. Rochelle, what's your experience been with, with COVID hitting and community uh, building support? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, we believe in, in robust community engagement. And I remember going to an, an event uh, once where there was uh, research done and it said, if you meet with uh, your community more than four times, you're adding 10% to the construction budget. I don't think people recognize that while it is critically important, there is a cost to it. So we're getting beat up on the cost of uh, development, but there is a reason for it. We believe, as I said, in, in very robust community engagement, but we do also believe in accountability. I think that the most meaningful is if cities would put some time uh, and resources into helping a community determine what their, uh, what their vision statement is so that developers know what they are, you know, what the community wants and can serve in that regard. Nobody wants to be the bad developer, but if you leave it uh, open-ended so that uh, community groups can uh, splinter and someone mentions something and you modify the drawings and then another group comes at a different time and, and they bring up another need and you modify the drawing, add up the number of meetings and the cost and it, it can make the project infeasible. So I believe there needs to be a date certain. There should be a comprehensive vision statement. A community can't, doesn't usually have the resources or the ability to do that. But if a city made that investment up front, you know, maybe $20,000 in consulting fees to work with the community, particularly now, as Laura says, that we are working virtually, I think that they can get a really good document that says these are the five must haves these are the five wish we could have. And a developer knows if you want to uh, serve that community as most of us want to do, then we will do our best to make those things happen. Thanks. You know, I, I mentioned the um, demographics of, of these seniors over the next 20, 30 years, uh, but also that population and especially in California is becoming more racially and ethnically diverse as well. Um, and so how do you make housing more equitable, equitable in an authentic way? Maybe we'll start with Rochelle and Leanne and Laura can jump in. Well, um, it needs to be uh, organic and authentic. Uh, the demographics of communities are constantly changing. Uh, some people call it gentrification. It, it probably is simply life. You know, the, the neighborhood that I live in, when I came into it, was predominantly Japanese. Uh, Ten years into it, it was predominantly uh, Black. Now it is equally a mix of Black and White and Latino. Um, when we serve our residents, it is the resident services coordinator who, if done well, really gets to know who your resident population is and can bridge that. You know, you've got, uh, I remember at our uh, Woodbridge Manor apartment, the, the 40 year old building, when we got, when we first did our, our first health uh, seminar, we had a large population of uh, Asian Americans, a large population of um, Russian and a large population of Persian. And interestingly enough, by asking the residents what they wanted, each group actually had very different medical uh, needs and medical practitioners. Um, 
And so the way to make your buildings authentically resonate to your residents is to get the residents engaged. They'll let you know. And as those demographics change, then your on-site services people will let you know and you just constantly evolve. Uh, you know, I, I say it this way, you know, a lot of banks would love to bring that boxed financial literacy program. It doesn't serve many people. I don't know that it serves any people, but the ones that are successful are the ones that will take the time to get to know your residents. We did a financial management class for our 80 year old Chinese residents. Uh, it was very different than what we might do for our teens and tweens. Uh, but when we take the time to get to know our residents, the response and the participation is so much better and everybody is so much better served by it. Thanks, Rochelle. Leanne? Um, I have a few thoughts I wanted to add to Rochelle's comment. You know, um, she also, I, in prior conversations, talked about her pillars too at IHO. And I really do feel like from a corporate standpoint, it stems from that, that uh, place as well. Um, and, you know, just adding, so she talked a little bit about the, the tenants of the affordable housing projects. I did go ahead and touch base with our market rate side. And um, even at Related, from a community and tenant perspective, we are doing a number of initiatives um, to help bridge that gap, you know, striving for, for um, internet equality, let me call it that, um, you know, bridging that uh, digital divide. So, you know, Related has partnered with um, Starry Internet to provide um, ultra low cost uh, internet, per, um, it's an ultra low cost um, broadband um, option to our affordable housing residents in our luxury market rate projects. So um, one thing you should note also about Related, we, all of our, not all of them, let me actually rephrase that. The majority of our luxury market rate projects have a component of affordable um, units within them. So for those, for those residents, Related is trying to do, to do its part to bridge that divide. Um, we've also hosted a number of local cultural events in, um, where we provide free space and in most case, cases even cover some of the costs. So, you know, it's really from a corporate standpoint stems from the top um, and really doing our part to, to help with um, bridging that divide. Thanks. Um, question for Leanne, and this is my final question. How do you engage your consultants and vendors? How do you build your project team? You know, what do you look for in industry partners? Yeah, um, well, we can also, you know, kind of piggybacking on a previous topic. Um, you, you know, we look for um, project teams, team members and partners um, where they can provide a synergy. Um, you know, with us. Um, we saw that on our first luxury market rate project in San Francisco, um, where, you know, for, let me rephrase that, luxury affordable senior, or not, luxury market rate um, senior development, you know, the one that's currently under construction. Um, in terms of, you know, just industry partners looking for best of breed, but really, um, we're, we have a number of consultants that we work with, and it's really about making sure our consultants and our vendors share that same vision as we do. You know, we want to um, also create a more inclusive and diverse pool of businesses um, and team members um, with whom we, we partner and collaborate. Um, you know, one thing I wanted to mention is uh, we support small businesses. Um, you know, we've partnered with uh, some local, local groups, um, awarded I found this really interesting, awarded over $250 million in contracts to businesses that are owned by underrepresented groups, including women. Oh. Laura, any addition to that? Well, I was just gonna add that um, oftentimes because we work so closely with our city partners, our city partners will have some preferences on um, architecture, um, some of the broader land use planning consultants that they've been working with and we'll tie in there on an inclusionary project, right? It oftentimes works to work with um, an architect who's doing other work within that development. But otherwise, um, you know, we have 
uh, consultants that we've worked with over the years who we, um, you know, who we trust. And so we'll continue working with them. But in the last uh, five years or so, we've had quite a bit of growth and expansion. And so we are working with a variety of new consultants that our development team has um, just gotten to know over the years or who has come by and showed us uh, their impressive work. And so we've gone, gone ahead and give them give them a shot at it. So, um, you know, the other thing, of course, and Sean, you're such an expert when you talk about all the um, the ups and downs of the affordable process, right? It is different than the market rate process in terms of projects ebb and flow and then the rush, 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 submit, wait, 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 then, okay, go, you gotta go, you gotta get your permit. So having consultants that understand that process is helpful also. Well, before I turn it back to Marissa, who's gonna field some uh, questions from the audience, um, I'd like to thank the three of you for what you do. Between the three of you, you've probably given a helping hand and affected hundreds of thousands of lives so, uh, in our community. So thank you so much for that. I also wanna recognize Marissa Feliciano with HBI, Dave Pintar with CW Driver and Cynthia Cook with RD Olson, who are your board members that put this event together and they've really helped us do this and pushed us and got, got us to the point where we're ready today. So back to you, Marissa. Okay, thank you. I want to field a few questions from the audience. And I see that um, you've answered, panelists have answered a few um, during, but thank you. Um, Renee Gibbons just wants to say, keep up all the great work. Um, Michael B, he says, Rochelle mentioned the importance of seniors being connected to transit and walkable communities with amenities. How important is that for Leanne and Laura when selecting sites? Well, I, I, you know, as Rochelle described it, we do like to have our seniors um, stay involved in the community. And so whether it's for seniors or families, we are looking for sites that are walkable, that have transit. Um, it is interesting in our family properties. So, I, right, I say family because they're two and three bedroom units, but we will have a few one bedrooms mixed in there. We do have seniors that prefer to live in our family properties. And at Jamboree, we, we uh, maybe five years ago initiated a policy where then if, uh, if we have residents in our properties across our portfolio that want to transfer to a different property that they get priority uh, if there's a waiting list, which is really nice so we can keep them housed if they're running into a situation. And so um, at some point, sometimes those seniors are ready to move. And especially here in Orange County, where we have a lot of senior and family properties, they can do that. Um, but walkability, transportation, extremely important, of course. Yeah, adding to what Laura said and Rochelle as well, um, it's really important to have amenities um, in close proximity to our sites. Um, and then in some cases, uh, we, we build them as part of our sites. <laughs> so if there's not a, a large family deal, you're gonna build more tot lots, more open space for kids to play in. So they have a place where that's really theirs um, and they don't have to walk a long distance. Um, and the, the project I presented on um, in um, introduction, uh, we built a public library, you know, so that was a great resource where um, not only seniors um, can go downstairs and go to the public library, but our families can walk out their, their unit, maybe walk up, you know, 100, 100 feet, and they pop right into the public library. Nice. Okay. Uh, another question from Teresa Ruiz. Are affordable housing developers using crowdfunding as another source of financing? Hmm. Well, interesting, uh, Teresa, that is actually something that we are looking at at IHO. Uh, in looking at ways to help our residents build wealth, uh, we are looking at the crowdfunding platform as a way of having them invest in the real estate mm -hmm. development um, and get a modest return as part of a way to not only get them engaged, but also to turn our adversaries into advocates because they have a vote, uh, some say so involvement in, in what gets developed in their communities. We're not, we have not looked at crowdfunding at Jamboree. Uh, what, what we are seeing and 
um, probably Leanne and Rochelle have seen this, is that businesses are getting involved in helping to fill gaps. And so we have been successful now with um, Disney, as well as the healthcare systems, several of the large mm -hmm. systems um, committing funding to our properties. And then uh, of course, uh, Home Depot has a strong commitment to veterans. And so you'll mm -hmm. see them step up on veterans developments with grants of, you know, a half a million dollars, a million dollars. So um, that has really helped bring in some kind of last mile financing on our projects. Oh, wow, that's great. Uh, I, let's see, I think that's uh, the last one is a comment. Um, great panel discussion, open, honest, and thoughtful. Keep it up, thank you. Um, so great. Marissa, I, I would like to make a, a comment. Sean asked about equity and, and one of the things that's really important to us, I took over as CEO three years ago at IHO and we have been really trying to understand what does authenticity look like. Uh, as a black woman, and, and coming from having my own business as an architect years ago, I remember constantly being confronted with, well, do you have the experience? Well, can you get the experience and then we can bring you in? Uh, you know, don't, I hope you're not offended. You just don't look like what I thought. And, and I find a little bit of that still happening with um, uh, in, in the development phase that you know, they will make assumption based on, you know, who our staff is or who shows up to the meetings. And one of the things that we decided very, uh, very strongly across the organization is that we would do our level best to make sure that in five years, people don't say, but, you know, I wish I could hire a, a find a great uh, minority owned insert name of uh, because then I would hire them. And so we're asking our colleagues to do what we're doing. And we are literally in our new contracts using our buying power to say, um, if you do not have people of color, of diversity in your uh, team, uh, we need you to reach out and mentor somebody. And yes, it takes time. And yes, it takes money, just as it does with any other staff member. But we will go so far as to make sure before we sign that contract, show us where you are bringing someone in. Our communities, one of our uh, council members said to us point blank, you know, we need you to have people that live and work in or look like our community. And so we have a project where 80% of the, the team that we have lives in, works in, or looks like that community. And it was conscious and intentional. And I will say in the last year, it used to be five years ago, if I had said to a general contractor, I need you to find a uh, minority owned uh, GC to work with them. They would have given me all the reasons they couldn't. They now will say without hesitation, sure, help me identify one, or sure, I'd be happy to do that. And I think that that is the responsibility of all of us as professionals who have that ability to broker those relationships, to use our dollars, to make sure that the workforce and our own teams are as diverse and representative of the communities we serve. Thank you for that final comment, Rochelle. I know in, as we were prepping for this, we had such an uh, engaging, natural conversation in and around that topic, and um, so glad we were able to bring it to the audience here. Well, I think that um, to, uh, sums it up for the day. I wanted to thank everyone for coming. Um, just a couple things for Council on Sage. We will be having a golf summer social coming up, so um, quick nine, nine holes at Ben Brown's and some networking and then get ready for our SAGE award ceremony. So that's gonna be October 21st, save the date, um, get ready with your submittals. We'll be um, taking submissions through the end of August and we'll finally be back to our awards program this year. Um, great, well, we appreciate you all being here today. Thank you so much to our panelists and our sponsors and Sean for moderating and we'll see you all next time. Thank you.